Hey everybody, welcome to the Dad Challenge Podcast. My name is Josh. Thank you for joining me for part four of my personal story and my journey through time and space and shit. Today we're talking about where we left off, where I was going to my second year of college. I got to give you a little bit of preamble into what happened after I left school, after the whole breakup and everything else, and then going to school. And I'm going to try to get it up to the point of where I live now, because that's kind of a, there's not tons in there. There's a couple great stories in there. Obviously how I met my wife, all that kind of stuff and all the other moves I've made, um, the band years, the glory days, everything. So let's go. Where we left off with that girl having a breakup with me, my heart's being broken, and I'm just kind of working really hard, building greenhouses, um, just living living life. I, I wasn't like, obviously I was sad, but I wasn't like depressed walking around moping or about or anything like that. I just kind of did my thing and was maybe hoping in the years to come that maybe she'd have, you know, an epiphany and be like, I don't care what my dad says, <laughs> you know, leaving my heart open. But uh, that never happened, obviously. So. Working greenhouses, I remember specifically the girl at school, the girl at church said, hey, look, I work at this school. You should check it out. It's called Briarcrest. It's in Saskatchewan. First of all, if you've never been to Saskatchewan, everybody, okay, it's, I'll show you in a minute on Google Maps. Okay. It's literally the flattest place on earth. There's like three trees. There's a hill maybe somewhere. I don't, I didn't see it, but there's some good and bad about Saskatchewan. We'll get to it. But I applied for the school because there's no way I could go back to Redeemer University. It was way too expensive, plus pretty sure I flunked out of everything because I did dorm rounds and played guitar instead of went to class. It was crazy. So I applied and I said, look, it's different because now I love music. Music has changed my life, and I think I want to be a uh, worship pastor. And if you guys don't know what a worship pastor is, it's not a real pastor. I mean, you get all the benefits of clergy and everything else, but basically you are a technical slash musical It's almost like a pastor of making plays, like they call it Sunday morning experience, right? Whatever comes on Sunday, the excitement, the stage designs, the lights, the sound, the smoke, the displays and everything else, all that's kind of like a worship pastor's foray generally, okay? And I wanted to play music. I was really getting into music and I thought, this is where I want to go instead of art. And oddly enough, it was right when Toy when I went to school to be an animator, it was classical animation. And that was on its way out. And obviously I didn't know because who knew? That's when Toy Story kind of dropped and all these movies started going into Pixar and then classical animation was kind of on its way out. So I stopped drawing and I started playing music instead. And music took over my soul, my life, everything. I loved music so much and I specifically loved worship music, which was an emerging... I mean, it's, it's been around for a long time, but that's when like real worship music was starting to pop, like become a huge, massive industry. Like, huge! I mean, this is like the beginnings of Hillsong. I don't even think Elevation was around at that point. And this is like, I think 1995 was kind of the year everything kind of started changing for music, right? That was DC Talks, Jesus Freak record. That was Jars of Clay, uh, Flood, which was a massive record. Um, Newsboys, um, Breakfast in Hell. You remember that song? So music started kind of coming along and then worship music started picking up. And the biggest record for me that kind of changed my direction of where I wanted to go in my life was Sonic Flood's Pink album. If you guys grew up Christian, everybody had this record. And it was, I think, if I'm correct, the first Christian worship record to go platinum, which is insane for that time because platinum is a million records sold. And it, this was before streaming. This is, I think, even before LimeWire was a big thing where like people were stealing music. So to sell a million records is massive. And so worship music could, took this huge shift. And by the time I went to school in 2001, worship music was a big deal. Like it, everybody was doing it. Bands were starting to emerge. It was becoming a multi, multi million dollar industry. So all that to say, I started leading worship at my church. And I was bad at it, but I was getting better. And then I started worship, leading worship with other people who were better. And then I said, okay, fine. I'm going to go to this school because they've got a worship program. They've got a piano program. They've got a songwriting program and a worship leadership certificate program. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I get up to the point where I, I, I get accepted to school. I'm very excited. My boss is excited because he's a Christian and he's given me a raise to help me pay for some of it. And obviously I'm taking out OSAP as well, which is Ontario Student Loans and going into further and further debt. And that's, I think that year was 12 grand or some insane amount of money. And don't forget, this was 20 years ago, everybody. 
twenty thousand. So I'm 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 forty thousand dollars in debt by the time it's two thousand and two. Sorry, thirty six thousand dollars in debt. Okay, insane. And it took me so many years. I think I ended up paying back something like sixty five thousand dollars because I couldn't even touch the principal on it because I could only afford to pay the whatever you call it the the shit, the interest rate on it for like so many years until I could finally get ahead. OSAP and student loans are really, really, really dangerous. We're talking about things like you're giving a kid, 18 year old kid who never knew anything about money, the access to some kind of debt that could leave them stranded for the rest of their lives, could be bankrupt. Student debt is crazy. I live in almost a socialist country. Start giving college university away for free. As a taxpayer, I'm happy to pay a little bit more of my taxes if it means kids will get free education. It's crazy to me, the industry. Anyway, in Christian music, private schools, even worse. So, okay. So I get accepted to school. I'm pretty excited. I'm ready to go on. This is like a new wave of life, okay? My buddy Brandon, he decides he's going to, to med school in like some school like Houghton. He's done with Redeemer too. So I'm like, I'm kind of on an island and I'm out. I have nobody there. Uh, I'm not going to that church anymore. I'm really not hanging around with anybody anymore. We kind of went our own separate ways as college started happening. I was away for a year and came back and then started working. And I'm like, I can't be here anymore. I'm done. And again, don't forget that I am like a, a wanderlust, right? I, I, I to, the, Up to that point, I'd probably moved close to 30 times, right? So that's nothing for me. And I remember talking to my friends recently and they're like, you just effing left. And they're right. I just left. And then they never saw me again, basically. So because I'm poor and, uh, you know, I have probably, I remember I had one effing uh, hockey bag full of everything that I own and one giant Tupperware container, which I still have. Okay. That's everything I owned. I took it to school with me, but I took the bus. You idiot. Such an idiot. Not realizing, let's get some directions going here. So if you don't know anything about taking a bus, welcome to Portville. I took the bus everywhere. Whenever I traveled to from New Brunswick back home, it was often I took the bus or uh, the one time I took the train by myself, which was crazy. Um, but the bus was kind of just the cheapest option ever, right? I have OSAP, I have a little bit of money and I'm trying to get there the cheapest way possible. And when you're poor, you don't really care, right? You're like, whatever's cheapest. And obviously the bus was the cheapest. And the bus is 27 hours. I remember being a lot longer on the bus because there's stops to be made and there's like 41 hours it took me to get there. So here it is, it's 33 hour route by car, right? But I took a bus of 41 hours. So I wanted to show you this. When you drive up through, so this is where I lived, down in Beamsville, and the bus took us all the way up here through Sudbury, all the way up to um, Thunder Bay. Thunder Bay, eh? Thunder Bay. And Thunder Bay is beautiful, okay? If you've never been up to Thunder Bay, you know, be careful, but it's cold and beautiful. But Thunder Bay, Full of mountains, it's mountainous generally, it's beautiful, green, gorgeous, okay? And I remember waking up in the prairies. So this is the prairies. Okay, and it doesn't look like much here, like, oh, it's not so bad, but dang, okay? When you're used to like mountains and like terrain and shit, the prairies are the most boring place on earth, basically, not kidding. So let's take it to where I was at school, whoa. So this is Saskatchewan, you wake up, and this is what you see, you're going to be a little bit like, oh my gosh, that's really flat. The joke is you can stand on a bottle cap and watch your dog run away for years and years and years. Now this one, this is a Trans-Canada Highway. This highway will take you through Canada all the way coast to coast to Canada. Okay. This Trans-Canada Highway. It is insane. So driving along, driving along thinking, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? I don't know anybody at this school. Um... But again, I'm not scared of that type of stuff. If you grew up like me and have moved as many times I, as I have, uh, you know, it doesn't bother you at all. Nothing, nothing really bothers you at that point. So we pull in to Karenport, which is right next to Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan. Okay. And this is Karenport. So you pull up and you're like, okay, it's not bad. It's flat, but it is what it is. And if you don't know anything about Karenport and Briarcrest, it is its own town built around the school. Okay. And there's a, there's a hotel that you can stay at if you come visit. And it's built around the school. And here's the school I'll show it to you. Nothing's really changed much actually since, oh, this is 2013. Oh, this, <laughs> that's because the friggin' Google car doesn't drive there very often. So there's the school. And uh, not a bad school. I had a good time. Uh, the only thing I can really compare going to Bible college to is honestly, it's going to Christian camp. Bible college is literally a year of Christian camp. 
You've got chapel in the morning every day in the chapel here, and the chapel's beautiful. It's really cool. It's I, don't know if it's, I wonder if it's still pink. It was pink, but it had these weird old horns in the top and everything. It was really cool. But uh, it's I, that's all I can say. It's like going to a Christian camp. Here is the cafeteria over here. This is the studio, the Tech Center Studios, where I learned to rec where I learned recording engineering, piano, and songwriting. And this studio is garbage. Okay, they were teaching us on, still teaching us on, a, a, is it Super Beta? I forget what it was. It's literally like like VHS tapes in this machine that records it digitally where you can multi-track into it. And it was so cheap at the time because the, people were recording on computers at that point and we still didn't have that. So we were taught a way of recording from the 80s, right? And I excelled past my teacher right away. I just like, I was like, I already knew all this shit. Um, and when you're, when you're immersed in music and you love it, you just, you already do your research and you just become really good at it. And you just kind of go to school for the certificate of it. Um, I also learned biblical foundations here. I had to, you couldn't even go to the school unless you're taking biblical foundations, like impossible. You have to take foundations and hermeneutics and things like that. Um, it was all right. I didn't have that much fun at the school. I, uh, I, I honestly was there to learn. I'm not there to meet my wife. Like so many people go to Bible college from like, I'm not here to meet women. I'm not here for any of that shit. I'm here to play music, to learn how to be the best damn musician in the world, because that is where I'm going to go with my life. I want to be a creative musician. I want to play music and I want to be awesome. And I'll show you guys my dorm because it's pretty cool. Actually. And so the dorm is actually pretty far away now that I think of it. But uh, this was our dorm right here. Brigman Hall. I remember I was on the bottom floor. Right. If you go to the, down this little stair here, down here, there's a bedroom right here. And we had to share it with a, a roommate. And uh, my roommate ended up being my bass player. And across the hall, guys both ended up being my electric guitar players. And then my best friend who I met, also named Josh, was my drummer. And he was the coolest kid in the entire world. What a great guy. We had such a good year. I had some really great friends and we played music. But this is also the year. And I'll never forget this moment. And I think a lot of you guys will remember the moment that 9-11 happened. But I was in my bed sleeping avoiding going to chapel because I'm pretty sure I went to chapel like five times. And I was like, I'm not going to chapel because it's in the morning and I want to sleep. But I remember people running up and down the hallway, just going, there's crying. There's people like, Oh my God, what happened? And you're thinking in your mind, you're like half asleep and you're like, what's going on. Right. And then you're like, you finally wake up and people, I'm like, what's going on? They're like, you got to come to the calf, come to the calf. The TVs are on, get over to the calf. And then it's showing, I, w I, sh I pulled up to the calf at the moment, the second airplane collided with the second tower. And everybody was like, oh my gosh, it was like a, this insane moment. And there's a lot of American students that went to this school as well. And the school shut down for a couple of days. There was just people just heartbroken. And I'll never forget that moment. I think of the moments of life, of history, if you were around for that and were cognizant, that is probably one of the things you remember where you were the most. So leave in the comments below where you were when 9-11 uh, hit the towers. Otherwise, just kind of learning music. I actually did, I was, I went to school, okay? Because music was my life. Music was my classes and I just immersed myself in school and not really getting social. I was like, I'm not here for that. I'm not here to meet women because I kid you not. And I think some women will admit to you that they honestly go to Bible college because they want to meet a man to marry who's in ministry because they want to be in ministry themselves, right? There are a lot of women who go to Bible college to meet their husband. And there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you're going to go meet someone who's like-minded, it's good it's a good place, I guess. A lot of people would just go and that's, they'd be like, honestly engaged by the next year or even after Christmas, people were getting married like that, like so much. And it's just like Bible college. You were not allowed in the girls' dorms, except every other Thursday, they rotated boys and girls' dorms. And then you were allowed in the girls' dorm for like 30 minutes just to kind of like, hey, what's up? Check it out and see what it's like. And they, everybody would clean their space and then you could come over. Doors had to be open. You were not allowed in the women's dorms. You were not allowed to hold hands on campus. You're not allowed tattoos. You're not allowed piercings. And I had my tongue pierced and my labret pierced at this point, right? I had my cartilage pierced and everything. It told me to get rid of it all. I was not allowed to have any of it. Um, I think the rules have changed since then, but it was basically, again, camp. And like, if you have sex or if you drink or do drugs, you will get kicked out of school. That's just the way it is. They have a code of conduct that you sign before you get there. The ethics you have to abide by, Christian ethics. And if you don't abide by them, you could be removed from school. But the, the, the funniest thing, there's this tree here. I don't know if you can see this tree. This little group of trees where people would go to make out and have sex in the woods. That's the woods. Okay, I'm not kidding. There's a pile of trees behind these houses. And that's where you would go if you wanted to do some shit. Or you drive in a moose jaw with your car. And there's also a creepy hospital moose jaw. So that was kind of my year there. Interesting enough, that's when I started my first band, which was called From Dust. <laughs>
so cheesy, but I liked it. And it was made up of my friends and a couple of girls uh, who were really, really good singers. So it was a worship team that we created because if you were part of a worship team and you were going to go do a spring tour and March break, like go around to churches and play, the school would fund it for you. So they'd give you a 15 passenger van, they'd give you a trailer and they'd give you a gas to go as long as you set up a table with all the Briarcrest brochures and convince kids to go to college. That's how they recruited. So we were a hip band. We were up and coming. This is when I was starting to get a little bit better. I still wasn't amazing, but the band was good. We were talented. Okay. And so I went to the school. I said, look, we got a band. We're going to hit the road. I've booked five churches in Ontario. We're going to go do this. They're like, cool. Here's everything you need. And I was like, really? They just gave us the van and shit. And we just went, I took a bunch of friends who helped out and who weren't in the band. And we just went on this massive, beautiful road trip. It was so incredible. And that was the moment that John Mayer dropped Room of room for Squares. And in that van, if you guys have never been in a van with nine other people, okay, it can get really stressful and annoying and everything else. And I would just sit in the back and I would put on Room for Squares and John Mayer saved my life because that road trip was crazy long and shit was breaking all the time. It was nuts. So we did our tour. Um, it was really successful. We came back and I'm like, this is absolutely what I want to do with my life. Amazing. A couple more memories from Saskatchewan. I had a friend there who lived way up in the country. I mean, it's look at it. It's all that. But she had a farm, massive farm. And she, her, my buddy and I, who was from Guam, my, my guitar player, he couldn't go home for Thanksgiving. I had nowhere to go. She's like, why don't you come for house for Thanksgiving? And I'm like, yeah, farm Thanksgiving? Hell yeah. We were shooting guns, riding four wheelers. Te- I was just incredible. And I remember that night, clear as day. Again, I know people are like, you remember a lot for not remembering a lot. It's true. Um, but there were these Northern lights and that's what Saskatchewan and the prairies are amazing for. If you ever get to catch the Northern lights in the prairies, just try it. Okay. It's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And generally they're green or blue and they fluctuate. Right. But this night was different. They were bright red. The most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. I wish I, I wish we had the technology we had today with cameras and stuff. Cause it would have been mind blowing to see it, but we didn't have that stuff. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't even have a computer still at this point. It was 2000, 2001, right? Yeah. So I still, I, I still didn't have a computer. So when I was writing my notes and I had to write papers, I had to use the library or borrow my, my roommate's computer. Like I didn't have any money, nothing. I was still so very poor, but my student loans were keeping me afloat. And then you get your tax return in March. And like, if you're a student and you're poor, you get lots of money. So that's kind of how you kept going. Um, I, 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 I have no idea how I survived after that, because I literally went from school with nothing, no job prospects, no home to go to, nowhere to land. I had nowhere to go. Okay. But nobody knows my story. I didn't tell anybody my story. Okay. So when we get back from school, school goes well. And I'm thinking, I got my certificate for my, my worship leadership and I got my recording engineering certificate and I'm good to go. I wasn't going to go back for another year. That's all I wanted to go with one year, get that thing and get out and go work at a recording studio or something like that. Right. Or start a band, which is what I did. Okay. So my, my buddy, my drummer, Josh, most amazing guy I've ever met. Such an incredible dude had a great, this is again, this is one more story of a family who just opened their home and their heart to me, to someone who had nothing. So Josh realized on our way back, um, he's like, I started telling him a little bit. He's like, so where are you going to go at the end of the school year? I'm like, I, I, this is me. And I'm not trying to, I wasn't trying to sad fish, nothing. I'm like, I don't know. I literally had no idea what I was going to do guys. And to some people that would freak you out, right? If you were, the school year is ending, you have no idea where you're going to go. I haven't spoken to my friends back in Beamsville the whole year because I just didn't, didn't have, didn't have anywhere to go. And I'm like, I don't know where I'm going to go. I, and I look back on that now and oh my gosh, I should have been more scared. I had nowhere. Couldn't stay on campus. I had to, I didn't, I didn't know if I had enough money to get home. Right. So anyway, Josh says, look, my sister's starting this student painters company. Um, we need painters for the summer. Why don't you come live with us in Ottawa until you find a place to live? And I was like, okay. <laughs> and they literally just let me move into their house. I did student painting for an entire summer. I worked for a sister and I then basically just found a place to live with some friends I had met years and years and years ago, which was kind of a coincidence, but that's basically how I got out of Karenport and moved to Ottawa. And that's where we landed. So I lived with him and his family for a few months. And then I got my own place with a bunch of other students right here. And I'm going to show you this place. I got a job at a place called excess cargo. Okay. This is retail, like just garbage. (laughs) But, and then I moved in with a bunch of students that I met, just met these guys. And is this it? Is this the house? 
Yes, here it is. I moved in right here. This house. Uh, it was musicians who lived there, a couple guys from church. And so I moved in and there was a there was a there was a Chinese guy upstairs named Ed. And Ed never ever left his bedroom except to work at Tim Hortons one shift a week. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure his parents were paying for him to live there and play video games. And call no, it wasn't Call of Duty. There was another game before Call of Duty, a shooting game, but I don't know what it was called. I never played online games. But I remember Ed was <laughs> just the most socially awkward person in the world. If he answered the phone, he'd be like, eh. That's how he would answer the phone. I kid you not. And if people are like, what's up, Eddie? Like, eh. He never talked to you. He just like closed his door. He ate a bucket of KFC chicken every week. And his shirt, he wore the same shirt for like a year. And it was almost disintegrating. He was gross. But he, he didn't bother anybody. Across from him was Jamie. Jamie was a brilliant coder. Like he was in school at uh, Carleton for uh, computer science. And was like, you know, to program Linux and everything else. But he was also video gaming. But I remember him being a vegan. And uh, all he ate was like lentils and he was so tiny and like, I'm like, dude, you need to figure that out. He's like, I'm good. I remember him taking the garbage out one time and he like lifted the thing and he broke his leg. <laughs> I was like, how did you break your leg? He's like, I don't know. He was, he just, cause he was vegan. That's what I said. That's what I think. Um, but he also, all they did was play video games and then went to school. So these guys went to school, played video games in the summer. All they did was play video games is incredible how they paid rent. I don't know how. I moved into this bedroom up here and then across was my buddy Nick who was ended up being my drummer in my first band back there. So I started a band called Million Stories of Failure. I kid you not. This was the emo phase, everybody. Emo was in and you had to have some kind of like dark themed band. So that was fun. Buddy of from the church named Matt, who I remember worked for a, a, a TV station and he made so much money when I thought was a lot of money. And we're like, why don't we build a recording studio in the basement? Because the basement was unfinished and it's, we just like, let's just do it. And we built a recording studio, like a legit floating studio, perfectly made for recording engineering, bought a big mixer, had a computer and everything else. And I kind of took it over. That was just like, I did that and uh, started recording bands. And then started recording our own band. And then we had the band that we would play a bunch of shows and had a really, really talented bass player. I had uh, Nick was the drummer and I had another guy, Jensen, who played guitar. And this just kept going, kept plugging away at music. That was my life. This is also the time I went to a church called The Met. And everybody was going to The Met. This was the biggest church in Ottawa and it was downtown at the time. Okay, so I'm just trying to think if I forgot anything up to that point. So no, just working at Excess Cargo and Tim Hortons, paying my rent and playing in a band. That's all it was at this point. I have no prospects whatsoever in my life. No money, massive amounts of debt, okay? Also, this is when the, um, about a year after, this is when the collection agency started calling me for the bell and the hydro. I'm like, I did, what? I never lived there. They wouldn't leave me alone. So I was scared. I had nothing. So I started going to the church, get plugged in there, start leading worship and going to the retreats and meeting lots of fun people. Um, it's where I met my buddy, Scott Larson. And this is another moment in my life. That's kind of really a bit sad, but Scott came from California and Scotty was the coolest dude I have ever met in my entire life. Okay. He was there for a school year trip, um, out West, actually, oddly enough, where my ex-girlfriend went to school, who was still going to school at this time. She knew him. He came to the school that was like this mansion that lived downtown. They were connecting students at this Bible college to politicians. It was how they were like, it was really weird. That's how there's these schools. Okay. These Christian schools, they will send these students to go work in politicians offices to make those connections. I kid you not. And so that's what they did for the year. They would, they work for, for, for politicians as for poli sci, right? Anyway, Scott was the coolest dude ever. I think he, I forget where he wasn't from California, but he was through and through the most California kid you ever met in your life. Played the coolest music. Have you heard of this band? You should check them out. And it's like the coolest band you've ever heard. And all my music kind of shifted after I started hanging out with him. I grew up listening to Tupac, Biggie, uh, Boys to Men, Jodeci, all like all the R&B and hip hop. That was all my life until this moment. Um, and then Christian music. And then this, when I started getting into punk and emo and he was the guy that knew it all. And Scott was just an incredible guy. We hung out so much. We did so many cool things inside the church. We did lots of friend group trips in Niagara Falls, had just built friendships galore. It was an amazing time of my life. I remember later too, I was working for, this is down the road. I was working at the West Jet as a ground handler and we got free buddy passes to head over to California because we met our quote quote or whatever. It was like, there was, I don't know, you got them. It was a benefit. And I remember going to visit Scotty in Hollywood because he was trying to make it as an actor and he lived in Hollywood and we stayed at his 
dump of an apartment and he was just trying to make it. He had become an extra on a bunch of like the OC and stuff like that because he was uber good looking and had that look. Right. And he was just trying to make it. And I remember him just just going for like a three or four hour walk, just shooting the breeze about how you do and what's going on. And he's like, look, Hollywood is dangerous, man. We had such an amazing moment and we were such really, really close friends and supportive of each other. And uh, a couple years ago, my friend who was really close to him and I both, she's like, did Scotty die? And then found out he just, he died. He just, he just had some kind of illness and he passed away. I, to this day, I don't know what he passed away of, but there's this traveling tie that is going around of Scotty's because he has impacted so many people in his life and I'm waiting to get it so that I can reminisce about Scotty. But that was uh, another playlist that I made of Scotty, of a person who had a big impact in my life who did pass away. So going to church, playing music getting better at recording engineering, starting to charge bands to do the stuff and, you know, make a little bit of money on the side, then started producing a lot of hip hop music. This is when I met my wife and everybody's been waiting for this moment. Yes, this is where I met Kathy, the Kathy, the famous, talented, beautiful, gorgeous mother of my children, best friend, 15 years, strongly married Kathy. Okay. This is where I met her. And this is how it went down. And she, she might correct me because I, this stuff I have a little bit of a bad memory for, but I think I met Kathy at a youth retreat and I think I have some pictures. I'll put them up here if I have them. Okay. And this, we would go on youth retreats to circle square ranch, like three times a year as young adults. So youth groups over. And when you become out of college, it's college and careers. So it's this age group of all these college age adults who are either working or in university. It's a dating thing. That's all it is. Right. They're just it's youth group for older people. So we would go on these retreats where we, I would play music with the band and that's where I met Kathy. I, I think we were doing our rounds at the tables for Valentine's day, singing to people. And she was there and she caught my eye. She did catch my eye. And here's the, that picture I have. And you know, Kathy's really shy and I was always drawn to shy girls. Always. I was all the girls I've ever known or dated in my life, all shy. I never dated someone like me because I was always loud, obnoxious and I just was drawn to people who were opposite of me, um, who were like completely opposite, even in their upbringing. I was drawn to people who were normal. <laughs> so I remember Kathy and I sparked a friendship and she joined the worship team and she sang. And I kid you not. I was like, oh my God, that girl. And I don't care what anybody says. I know that you guys think I'm biased, but I'm not as a professional musician myself. Kathy is the best singer I've ever played with in my life. And I've played with tons of singers. I'm not saying she's the best singer in the world, but to me, I've yet to see someone who's been better that I have played with. And I've played with hundreds of musicians and singers. Okay. She is very, very gifted naturally at singing. Just something incredible about her voice. It's smooth. It's controlled. Her pitch is almost perfect, if not perfect most of the times. And it's it, there's just some tonality about it that's jazz and soul that it's very hard to come by a voice like Kathy's, okay? So she played on the worship team. She's a singer. She was attractive. I liked her attributes and her poise. And she was really nice to me. Like, she really was. She was just a very sweet loving person, loved everybody, no drama, just really cool down to have some fun, like hang out with people, uh, had a car, which was a big deal. A lot of, none of us had cars, um, you know, came from a loving family and we just got along. We all just this really, really tight group of friends became, there was this group of people that came really, really, really tight together. We did everything together. Every time we hung out with someone, it was with that group of friends. Half of them slept at my house all the time because we just had a rolling group of people come through our house because a bunch of students, no one really cared. It was like a frat house almost without the partying and drinking and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was what it was. We did everything together. And at that time, a buddy of mine was selling his old car. And so here's my first car experience. And I think a lot of you guys know this. Your first car is a big deal. I didn't even get my license until I was like 19, I think right before I went to Karenport. Saskatchewan. And I didn't, why? Cause I didn't have a car. I didn't need one. And I never have ever had, like, as soon as my parents were divorced at the time I was 13, I grew up without a car until I was 22 years old. Okay. I never had a car ever. So those friends of people who had cars were like my saving grace. I always had friends that would have cars. And so at this point, this buddy at church was like, Hey, I'm getting rid of this Dodge Colt. Do you want it? I'm like, yeah, what do you want for? I think it was like 200 bucks. <laughs> And it was for a reason. This thing was a piece of shit. Okay. But I have good memories of this Dodge Colt, but basically it looked like this. It's like a hatchback piece of garbage. Okay. Just trash. And I couldn't safety it. And at that time, Kathy, I said for her birthday, I said, 
here is a one free song you can record in the studio. I'll help you write it and we'll do it. And we wrote this song that didn't even make it on the record was like Party Girls or something. It was really cheesy, really, really cheesy. But she liked it. And we were like, we worked really well together. We wrote songs together. Um, she was very t like easy to work with because she's so talented. Just everything rolls off. Her melodies were good. She'd write, she'd write the melodies and I'd write the words. We were a really good team. And so she liked that. And I said, okay, you want to do a whole record. If you pay to put my car on the road, I will cut your entire record. And that's what we did. I think it was $1,100 to, to, to put that car on the road. It was my first car. I was so excited. So we start cutting the album and, and do this whole record together. And it was really, really good. We got really close. We worked every spare moment we had. She was working full time. I was working. But every spare moment she, we were doing this record. And it was a good ex learning experience for me. And I was getting good at it. I was bringing in great musicians from all over. One of the songs was called Oh My Soul, which was the which was the, the, the title track of a record, right? The record was called Oh My Soul, and I have the CDs. And uh, so this is what came out of it. This was the big song. I need you to hear this. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna stop you there. This guy's name is Miracle Child, and he was a hip hop artist that I had connected with, a Christian hip hop artist who was really, really talented. So I was connecting all these musicians and putting them on Kathy's record. I'm trying to create some smooth music for the soul for people to listen to. Shake this out, listeners. Talk to him, Kathy. All I can think about is how you make me feel. You wrap your arms around me and whisper in my ear. Everything's gonna be alright. Okay, you guys can go listen to it. It's on Spotify. Kathy Barber, if you want to hear more. But that's what we did. That was, I meant, again, and that for the production value and everything we did was really, really, really good for 2001. Okay, I was getting good at this. Um, and I'm just, this was going to be what I was going to do. I was going to either produce music or I was going to start a band and, or I was going to do both, which a lot of people do. So we did the record and we, we printed it. She had a couple of shows put, we sold that, that record in all the, uh, Christian bookstores and she was on the radio and it was a really good experience. And then, uh, I think the next October, Kathy won a gospel music award for the best urban R and B soul album of the year. We didn't know, like, I remember it cause we were all, we were engaged and they had called us and said, are you going to come out to this event in Calgary? Are you going to come? We're like, no, because we didn't think we we're going to win. Right. And she, that was their way of hinting. You should probably come out. But she won the, she won the, I remember it was like, we checked the time. It was like 10 o'clock at night. She's like, I think I just won. And we looked at it and she won this. It's a pretty prestigious award for Christian music in Canada. It's like the Dove Awards for the US. So she won this record and the record is really good. Like Kathy is really talented. It's, I mean, it's. It's a little bit cheesy, but Kathy's voice works on anything. And there's Christmas songs with Kathy you can check out on my own channel. Kathy will sometimes come to the firesides in the summer and sing with me. She's so talented. So all that time we're working, I'm falling in love with Kathy. Like I'm in like, my wife was absolutely everything to me. She, she was the exact person I needed in my life at that exact time. She was a helper. She was talented. She was funny. She was giving. She uh, honestly, it just was everything that I really needed. She was hot. That kind of helped, not gonna lie. It was, a, it was a good relationship through and through, but I remember I told you guys, I, would, I didn't really want to get married anymore after my first whole thing, right? I, I, I told myself, I'm, I told myself I'd absolutely not marry a singer either for some reason. I don't know why I said that. Um, or somebody in ministry. Um, and then I ended up meeting someone that just ended up being that for me in every single way. She was everything that I needed and I'm hoping I was what she needed too. I did challenge Kathy to take steps outside of her comfort zone a lot. She was very sheltered, um, very, you know, straight edged, right down the middle of the path, didn't really take many risks or anything like that, but uh, just her upbringing, really, really well, incredible family, you know, sports athlete. She was a figure skater. She just was really, she was confident and at the same time, not cocky at all right she was just mint and she could sing like i remember listening to her sing while editing her voice and just being like falling in love with her because of her voice too like that was one of the biggest things so 
Time comes around. I move out of this place to another place um, downtown. Let's see if we can find it for you. Then I moved to this apartment here with a good buddy of mine. Um, we just... He actually had lived with me on the other one, but we had to get out of there because it was getting too packed. All the students were leaving. We're like, oh, I didn't want to pay the whole rent, so we just left. And I moved to this place. And this is where I got my precious Xena. My pit bull, my glorious dog, who was everything to me. And I was full-fledged dating Kathy at this point. I was working at the airport as a ground handler for WestJet. Then I moved over to Sunwing and I was a, a customer service agent, which is like the best place to work if you love to watch people. Just like, and roast them in your head, right? People watching is what I call it. Being working at the airport was really, really cool. I enjoyed it a lot. You get paid a little bit more. You're part of a union. Again, I got to go to Hollywood and have some time out there. Um, and I had a recording studio in this bedroom. So I was always recording. I always had something going. And uh, I remember parking in the back lot here with my sweet car. And this is the time I got the, um, I upgraded my car and I bought a Volkswagen from another guy at the church. Volkswagen Golf. That shit was awesome. It was such a better car. And so this 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 was kind of a blur for me. My buddy had to leave. He couldn't live there anymore because he had to get back home for something that was going on and I had to leave because I couldn't afford the rent by myself. And so um a little bit is a little bit rocky at that point, but Kathy was really helping me out with a lot of stuff too. Like my wife again saved my life. One of those people that comes along to your to you and is like your saving grace. Like I owe Kathy my entire life. Everything. Okay, or everything, which is why I would do anything for her. I would bury a body for my wife, right? I would absolutely. Um, and so she was always been there and Zena was my, my dog and it was just, it was a good time. Not much went down there, just kind of was working, building towards what we were going to do. I wanted to uh, ask her to marry me eventually. So I had to go talk to her dad, dad. But before that, I moved over to this street and I found an apartment up here by myself. I think it was 800 bucks a month, which is insane. Two bedroom apartment with uh, everything you needed. Except for laundry. Did it have laundry? I don't know. I don't know if it had laundry. But I moved in with my dog, and that's when I found Sam. And I hope I have a picture I can put up here for you. This is when Sam and uh, Zena met for the first time, and they became best friends forever. And Sam always tried to run away, and it was fun. But I also had a recording studio in this house, and I was producing a lot of hip hop. I was getting into this scene locally with a lot of hip hop artists. They would come, and I would produce their music for them. And it was getting, I was getting really good at producing that kind of music, and I was having a lot of fun. This is after Kathy's record had dropped. And so this is the, this is when I asked Kathy to marry me. And so here's how it went down. Okay. So I had this plan. You guys know I'm a romantic, right? I've always been a romantic type of guy. I remember even before dating Kathy, we had this thing called the Secret Ninjas. It's like this youth group boys club where we would like do romantic things for the girls. I don't know. It was really cheesy. It was weird, weird. But we did it. We always had these, these really, we always made these elaborate things to make people feel good and to do romantic things. It was really fun. So what I did here was, like, okay, so first I went and asked her dad. So that was kind of what you do in church. You go and ask the father, hey, I'm, my intentions are to marry your daughter and I want to know if you're cool with that. And I remember he was working I don't know where he was working, some big building downtown for the government. And he came out and meet me, and met me. And he's like, it was just kind of a conversation. Just like, just to let you know that she means a lot to me and blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, my intention started to marry her. I'm just wondering what you think. He's like, sounds good to me. <laughs> so I was like, cool, let's do this. So here's what I did. Cause I had to get their parents in on it. So we had friends that were a little bit up North in the place called Stittsville. Okay. And they had this big lot. And so it was Kathy's birthday. And so I said, um, Kathy, let's go hang out and everything else here. It's going to be, I wanted it. I wanted to propose her on her birthday as that's like her birthday gift. I don't know if that's a gift anymore, but it was, I guess she got a ring out of it. So here's what I did. So I had somebody put an alarm under her bed, an alarm clock with a note. Okay. And it had a blindfold. And so the alarm clock goes off, I think like midnight. So she had to be sleeping by this point. I wanted her to be dead tired. <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> you don't even want her to be sleeping. I didn't <laughs> and so the alarm went off. She puts the blindfold on and I have a friend waiting outside to pick her up. And the note says, put this blindfold on, wait on your front porch. Okay. And I had these two friends go pick her up, put her in the seat. She doesn't know who it is. She doesn't know what's going on. Um, and they drive her out to the spot. Meanwhile, I'm at that spot with a buddy of mine who's taking pictures. And I set up this whole row of tea lights, like a huge row giant row of tea lights and they, they drive her around so she doesn't know where she's going and then eventually I'm waiting at the end of this like row of lights then they they put her there and they said in 45 seconds or whatever take off your blindfold okay and then they ran away everybody ran away and so she takes off her blindfold and I'm waiting at the end of the row and it's like in the our song which became our song uh, on, a, on a long road trip back from Toronto it was Beauty and the Beast because we love Disney 
And that was her song. And that was our song. And so I had that playing and she had to walk up the thing and I said, happy birthday. And like, this is your birthday present. I gave her a present. I don't know what it was. And I'm sure that she remembers this completely different. It'd be interesting to hear her side of the story. But uh, she's like, oh, well, that's amazing. I just uh, gave her a big hug and a kiss and said, happy birthday. I just wanted to make it special for you. I did not propose yet. And so I don't know what she was thinking because there was no way she had an inkling that I was about to propose. No way. There was no conversation about getting married. Nothing. Nothing. This was full surprise as far as I'm aware. And then uh, I was like, oh, let's get going. Let's go hang out. And then uh, before I did that, I was like, oh, I got one more thing. And then I took um, the ring out of my pocket and got on my one knee. And then I opened up the ring and she started bawling her eyes out. And I said, hey, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Let's give this thing a shot. I'm kidding. I didn't say that. I said, you know, will you be, will you be my wife? And she said, yeah, no. And then I've met some other girl. No, I was kidding. She totally said yes. And my buddy Kyle's taking pictures behind the tree and everybody, she's crying and everything. It's an amazing moment. Um, I give her the ring. Uh, yeah. And that was, I wanted to make it really special for her. I wanted, I think that that's who I kind of really was. I really wanted to make people's memories of me or the things we did together special so that they had that because I don't remember really having much. I think, I don't know the psychology behind it, but that's, I mean, that's it. Then we got married and had kids and that's the end of the story. Just kidding. So a year later we are married and here's some photos and you see how fat I was. Obviously it was a big boy uh, and you can see Xena there. And uh, we were just, it was just whirlwind after that. <laughs> if you want to hear some funny stories about the wedding. Okay. So if you want to hear a funny story about how, leading up to the wedding, <laughs> I was like, let's just have a barbecue because at this point I was shooting weddings for like on the side for money and I hated weddings. I hate weddings. And I was like, let's just do a barbecue where your parents have a huge yard. Just invite people over, play some tunes. No. Her mom was like, mm, no, my first, my first born or my first daughter is not getting married in a barbecue. Okay. It's not happening. So they, their parents said, look, we'll help you pay for the wedding and everything else. And we had this glorious wedding at a hotel, like the, the traditional wedding, like, you know, amazing church. We got married at uh, Elgin street. Let's I'll show you this. We got married at this church here. Um, cause Kathy's parents were members of this church. And so, um, this is where we got married. Glorious gorgeous church really really nice for photos and everything else and uh yeah it was really fun and got some photos here but leading up to it my one job okay was to pick the meal that we were gonna eat or the, the menu and even that i picked delicious chicken and rice or something it was awesome and they, even they switched that on me. i didn't have anything but i did have the one flex the one competition thing that i won my wife wanted a tier of cupcakes for everybody. It was like just triple tiers of cupcakes made by a person. They were delicious. But I said, forget that. And I went and bought this massive plate. It, look, it feels massive in my name. It was, uh, it was um, Cinnabon. Just hundreds of Cinnabons and like all the sugar on the side. You can just take one and go. And I had a microwave set up. And people just ate the Cinnabon. I was going to say it was the best wedding cake ever. And there's pictures of me being fat eating that stuff. So. Anyway, that's my wedding. It was an amazing, incredible journey up to that point. The thing, a thing I never thought I would do. My sister, my mom was there. All the kids were there. It was a big moment of celebration of pride in my life. My mom cried a lot. She was really, really proud of me. And this is, again, this is later in life where mom um, still lived that type of life. But at the same time, she was starting to soften up a little bit and starting to be, you know, uh, nicer i guess we would talk on the phone a little bit more here and there um i had visited a lot more since then i think from the time i moved in with my sister um i think the next time i saw my mom was not until i was married i want to say till i was married years and years later we married in 2000 and 2007 we got married in 2007 <laughs> so i think it was a lot it was a bunch of years from me being a teenager until i saw my mom next in real life right um, and we'll talk about my mom's story in part, in part five. Um, so yeah, it was an incredible journey. We went on our first cruise together or no, it was our second cruise because the first cruise, I forgot to tell you about the first cruise. So we went on a cruise together and this was the whole plan. I said, I want to go on a cruise. I want to take a trip with you because I want to see what we're kind of like traveling together. I want to, cause Christians who don't have sex before they get married, don't live together before they have married, nothing before marriage. Okay. Not really anything. And I did, we waited everything we did the whole christian thing and so i really wanted to just do something where we could go be together without anybody else to see what it was like and i had this plan and i said if it works out if everything's good i'm going to tell kathy i love her on the cruise ship and i remember um everything was amazing okay really nice bikinis and stuff too not gonna lie don't tell her i said that but <laughs> really really good and i remember one night i'm like you know what i gotta i gotta do something we were just about to fall asleep we had i kid you not we had bunk beds i'm not joking okay i'm not kidding 
we were like it was a true thing it was really important for us to keep our that right i'm not even kidding so anyway it was like late at night I was like hey can we go up and i got something for you so i brought my guitar up to the deck we sat down and i sang the song i wrote for her and it was how i told her i loved her because i wrote her a song about it about everything that she was to me and everything else and she cried and uh, that was the moment actually that i knew i was going to marry her that was it i so all the plans from that point forward were put in place to get married to her and wanted to make sure that she was cool with it too you know what i mean so yeah, we had a, we had a, we had an incredible journey. First year of marriage was really good. We got our first house and that's when I started playing in my first real band. Okay? Hearts in Stereo was when shit started going down. So we're married when I'm 27. Get in our first house, got the dog, we got macaroni came along, a little kitten macaroni and then just living the dream. Kathy's working full time, I'm working full time for a place called Goodbye Graffiti literally removing graffiti with chemicals that could peel your face off, okay? Loved the job, everything else, but then I started recording more music, and I said, I'm about to do this, I'm gonna do this. I wanna start a band, and I wanna just do this, for real. Because now I know how to record, I've been in a couple of bands, but I really wanna do it, and that's when I started Hearts and Stereo. And those were the glory years, let me tell you. I had so much fun. We were pretty popular in this province, in Ontario, we did a lot of touring. We played in over, we played in front of over 70,000 kids. We toured at one point for six months straight with this group of people that would go around to schools and talk about social justice and like um, helping people around the world and telling stories about being bullied. And just when you ever been to those, those, those things at school where they bring in, they just get everybody hyped up to do something cool or want to be a part of something cool. That's what it was. And so we toured, we played so many shows. Our biggest fan base was Sarnia. And these kids were young. I had a, Jamie, I think, was 17. Pat was 18. I was like 28. Then Ryan was like 27. And Johnny was the same age as me. And we got all together and we just rewrote albums and we toured. We had a we had a handicap bus that we turned into a tour bus. I had a bed in it, TV, chairs, and we had a trailer that we would tow. That shit was dangerous and expensive. But we were really, really, really fun. We weren't the best band in the world, no. But we were the most fun to watch live. I wish I could go back and record all those things that we did. We had an amazing, amazing time. We toured out to the East Coast a lot. We did so many cool things. If I, I encourage any young person who's into music to do is to just go do those things because you will lose money. It costs everything you have. I spent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars and did not get any returns from that. But it was worth every penny to just have that experience and it turns you into someone else. I always learned to, when I, when we toured with that group of people, um, they, we had to speak in front of students and I got really good at speaking in front of students. And then we were playing the same songs every day, sometimes three or four times a day at three different shows. We got so tight. And so everything was really good and we had a really good time and the band was a big deal. Kathy was at home a lot with the animals and working full time and she allowed me to pursue my dream. She really did. Up to that point, we were both working and when I was on the road, I was no longer working. So she had to like, we had to save money and then anything that came in, we had to pay bills with. And she just allowed me to live that dream. She kind of saw, I think, that I needed to do something like that because of my past. Um, and I, I think even at that point, Kathy didn't know everything about my past. There were certain things I did tell Kathy about before we got married so she was aware. Um, and I think she realized this was something that made me happy, that made us happy, that made me feel fulfilled and that she could also be a part of because she would sing on the records and stuff like that. So the band days were amazing. Okay. And that happened for, I want to say until I was about 30, it was a few years, like, yeah, a few years, three or four years. And then after the six month tour about being on a school bus with a bunch of people, we were like, we can't do this anymore. We're not making any money and we got to get on with life. One of the guys had his law degree. One of the guys had to move back to up north and the other guys were just like, ah, we can't do this anymore. So I got another lineup of guys, did a bit more touring, did another record, um, a pop record that I thought was going to make it. And then uh, we were really good too. Those guys were really, 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 really talented, had a couple of really good business partners in that um, and just brilliant musicians. And then I remember one day Kathy just comes home and she's like, I'm pregnant. And this is our second house, by the way. Um, people hated us because we practiced in my garage, but she's like, I'm pregnant. And then, uh, the next practice I had with the boys, I said, boys, I'm hanging it up. It's done. We're having a kid. And, uh, this is awesome and I love it, but this is going to be the most important thing I ever do in my life. And so this is going to be our last show coming up. And I remember that last show, whew, like tears 
a heartbreak. I remember the last show with the original lineup guys too, because we were so close. Just the tears and the bawling and everything else. These, uh, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. Getting married was the best thing I ever did to the most amazing, incredible woman of my life who allowed me to do those things. But this was super rewarding in the fact that we built into a lot of kids because we were a Christian band. We were mentors to a lot of kids. Um, we gave a lot of kids hope in our lyrics and in our message and just hanging out with them. And we had a lot of fans and we just, we were really, really responsible with what we were given in that platform. And we did a lot of good with it. And I'm really proud of what we did. Um, but then once, once mom is pregnant, it's over. This is like, imagine now, you know, my entire story. Okay. Before this moment, everything leading up to this moment, I'm scared for the first time in my life. I'm not scared shitless to take a train from Toronto to New Brunswick. I'm not scared shitless of not knowing where I'm going to live next. Nothing like that. I'm scared shitless when she tells me she's pregnant. I got, we were, it's not unplanned. We were planning this, but I'm like, Hey, this is, this is it. And, uh, you know, the band kind of disbanded and this was it. It was leading up to the moment where I had Everly. And I did film that stuff and I put it on the internet before I knew any of this thing was wrong that you can't find that video anymore. It's privatized and it's only seen by our family now, but I was really proud of that. My wife and I would sing songs, um, about, I think I could show you that one cause there's no kids in that one, but we did the, this is love. So every time Kathy was pregnant, we did a, a, a birthing announcement for Facebook for our friends and it was done with a song. So And Weston also had a song when he was announced as being as when mom was pregnant and then he had a song when he was born. So music has always been an incredible part of our life too. And that's, I think why Kathy really appreciated it too, because she's also an incredible musician and singer. And so she allowed me that. So leading up to the point where Everly is born, um, my, um, I want to see. Yeah, there's a lot here. I know there's, this is so long, whatever. I got to keep going because I want to lead. The next part has to be about my mom's side of things. So my mom actually came out to help give us a hand um, and help us with the house and take care of us and everything else while Kathy's ready to have this baby. Um, we're living in a townhouse. We're prepping the room, which you can see in the music video. Like we're doing, we got a closet full of diapers. Someone had like made fun of Kathy for buying too many diapers and she was bawling her eyes out. I'm like, why are you crying? But pregnancy, right? Uh, my wife was just absolutely glowing, gorgeous pregnant. She loved being pregnant. I loved everything about it. The journey was incredible. She's such a caring and beautiful mom. Like everything was about this little thing growing in her body and like just prepping and just ugh, such a good, honest 
relaxing, carefree, also stressful <laughs> moment in our lives. Just, we were ready. So by the time Everly came, I was ready to be the dad. And when she was born, I can't show it to you because all my friggin' haters are gonna be like, you're showing your kids and you're exploiting them. But I remember the moment she was born and she was put on that weight, that scale. I, I, she was holding my pinky. <laughs> she holding my pinky. And she's looking right at me. I know she couldn't see me, but she's looking right at me. And I said, I will do everything in my power to protect you. You are, like I was just, I was finished, okay? That video, I mean, if you're close enough, I would show you the video, but I'm not gonna make it public, but it was a really big moment in our lives and Everly changed our lives forever. She was the firstborn grandchild, so she's like the jewel of the family. Gorgeous curls, just beautiful. She was amazing. And her best friend, Kathy's best friend, their daughter was born like three or four months later and there's a picture of Everly on her belly with her best friend in the belly. And they're to this day our best friends. And so like we just had a really good community around us. We had support with parents and everything else and everything was great. And then the boys came to live with us. And I'm not telling you their story because it's not my story to tell. But there was some hard times. They were taken and put into our care because this, we took them because that's what family does. Okay. And then at one point they went back because everything seemed to be going well. Then we, then we got pregnant with Weston. And then as soon as Weston was born, the boys came back. And this time it was like, okay, we have to make this choice. We're going to adopt now. We don't want them to go back and forth. We don't want them to be, you know, bounced around. This is it. We're going to make, we're going to make the choice and we're going to fully adopt. And that's when I first started realizing, I guess I make some damn money. <laughs> I got to get a real job. So after the band stopped, the, there was a lot of things I could have done. And the first thing I did was get my real estate license, which is what everybody in ministry does afterwards. But then I started realizing, Hey, I love playing music and I'm good at this. So why don't I become a worship pastor? Because I know I can do this and I know that it's something I would enjoy. So I got my first job at a church up in Sitzville and I was a worship pastor and I knew it was going to be my stepping stone into something bigger, but it paid decent and it allowed us to grow our family in the church and to Kathy worked full time too, after, you know, kids were a little bit older and we were comfortable. And so this was where we were. Our lives were comfortable. We bought our first dream house, which wasn't, I mean, I look back now, the house was $420,000 or something like that. And you can buy that same house right now for over a million. That's how much the market has increased since we left. So I'm leading up. I know this is a little bit long. So the kids are born. Life is great. Um, everything is awesome. And that story I think is what was the big push into getting me my next job where, where I live right now for the big time the big job, which is becoming worship pastor of that big church. And I'm not going to tell you that story because there's a five part series. You can go watch right now on that entire story. So that's where we landed. We moved away, came here for the dream job that paid decent, that would allow us to, you know, have more kids or whatever the case may be. Maybe Kathy wants to go back to school or whatever. And that is what we did. We brought the, so we, and we, so we, the whole fam family came down and everything was kind of going along nicely until the whole ex pastor situation came around. Okay. And then you guys can go watch that. So next part of the series is when I first started the church and then my mom's story. And I'll tell you my weight loss journey. Really, really cool story. So holy, sorry, that was really jumbled, right? But you guys don't care. Whatever. I want to thank you guys for being here, listening to my story, even though it could be boring at times. Um, but I'm glad I'm putting it out there. Honestly, this is more for me than it is for you guys. I'm glad that my kids one day will be able to watch this. I'm a little older because of some swearing in it. But uh, I'm glad I'm putting it down there. I'm glad you guys are here to watch that. And I want you guys to know how valuable and incredible that you are. And I want to thank you for just being interested enough to hear my story. It's super therapeutic. I'm not going to lie. Take a deep breath. <sighs> awesome. Don't forget your value, your worth. I think you're amazing and I will see you 